Well, I'm excited to now be joined by Michael Schellenberger, journalist and author of Apocalypse Never, Why Environmental Alarmism Hurts Us All. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, Michael. You wrote an article in Substack arguing that the West, what you describe as green delusions, have empowered Putin. Could you elaborate on that, please? Well, sure. I mean, Putin knew that he could invade Ukraine and that there would be few economic consequences. I mean, we are obviously seeing sanctions on banks, but the energy was carved out to uh, not be subject to sanctions against Russia. Europe and the West knew that it couldn't sanction uh, Putin's energy exports without triggering a global recession. That recession may still be triggered. You know, oil prices are at $100 a barrel. They could go to $200 a barrel. We're in the worst energy crisis that we've been in globally since 1973. You know, I point out that Europe 15 years ago exported more natural gas than Russia did, uh, produced more, I should say. And then, but now today, Russia exports three times more natural gas than Europe produces. Part of the reason for that is that there were green campaigns against fracking, both in Britain and in the rest of Europe. And we've known since 2014 that the Russian government has financed anti-fracking activism. The Secretary General of NATO at the time said that this was occurring. Secretary of State at the time, Hillary Clinton for the United States, said this was occurring. A, a French professor at Sciences Po uh, two weeks ago just released a report finding that the Russians had financed anti-fracking uh, advocacy in Europe. So without being able to punish Putin uh, by imposing sanctions on his energy supplies, the West was unable to deter his invasion of Ukraine. And, and you mentioned um, the Kremlin, for example, effectively funding some elements of the anti-fracking campaign. And it is bizarrely and ironic because you often hear, you know, so-called dirty money from the fossil fuel industry. But there's been less discussion about how, for example, uh, the Kremlin has benefited from um, anti-fracking campaigning. I mean, why, why do you think that's not necessarily been as much part of the discussion? Well, because we've been in... In the West, we've been in a delusional, utopian fantasy for the last 20 years. The fantasy has been that climate change threatens human extinction. It's apocalyptic. It's become to take the role of a secular religion. There's no question that climate change is real and that it's being caused by humans, but we've been doing a really good job adapting to it. In fact, um, we've had a decline in disasters, climate-related natural disasters over the last 20 years. Last year had the fewest deaths on record from natural disasters in recorded human history. We're doing a really good job adapting to it. Carbon emissions have been going down in Britain, France, and Germany. They've been declining since the mid-70s. They declined 22% in the United States since 2005 mm -hmm. because of fracking. And yet people fell in love with renewables um, particularly solar and wind, as sort of a fantasy of how to harmonize human societies with nature, you know, our heads were in the clouds while Putin's feet were firmly on the ground. Mm. Um, uh, GB News presenter Nigel Farage has um, argued in the papers today, you may not have seen it, that, that there should be a referendum um, on net zero. I mean, what, what do you make, think of the idea just in general in other Western countries? Do you think that there needs to be more democratic discussion or possibly um, referendums, essentially, on whether or not we should be going full steam ahead when it comes to a lot of the green policies? Yes, well, I mean, I think Farage has an interesting you know, record on, on referendums. It would be very interesting to see that. I mean, look, I just think climate change, you know, it's real, it's important, it's something, it's one of the factors that we should use to make our decisions, but it's not the only one. Energy security is paramount. If a nation doesn't have energy security, it doesn't have national security, which means that it's not able to protect its people. This is serious stuff now we're talking about. We're talking about being unable to deter tyrants like Putin, giving control to people uh, like Xi in China, who con basically controls the global solar panel supply. Nations, for the most part, need to control their own energy. When they don't have control over their own energy, they're subject to other countries' power. So. You even see in South Korea is coming back to nuclear energy. Nuclear energy is obviously a really great solution for energy security purposes. You can stockpile significant quantities of nuclear fuel rods. 
You can also do the same thing with coal, but coal obviously produces significantly more air pollution, whereas nuclear is the only way that we've known how to fully replace fossil fuels in electricity um, and other forms of energy. And just very quickly, because we don't have a lot of time, um, do, do you think that um, this crisis that has been unfolding in Ukraine will be a wake-up call to Europe and the West when it comes to energy security, or do you think that it may just fade into the background? No, it's this is game changing. I mean, this is the end of the post. This is not just the end of the post Cold War era. Where I think we're at the end of the post war era. Yeah. I think it is uh, going to be a wake up call. We've already seen France, Japan, uh, to some extent Britain. Um, we may see Germany and Belgium uh, stop the process of shutting down their nuclear plants. Um, yeah. I think it's game changing in the United States. So I think we can expect to see a return to nuclear and an expansion of natural gas and oil production in the West. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Michael Schellenberg, a journalist and author of Apocalypse Never, Why Environmental Alarmism Hurts Us All. What do you think, Charlie? Do you think that this is game-changing and that this is perhaps um, an era-defining uh, situation that has unfolded over the last few weeks and that we are going to fundamentally rethink things when it comes to energy and green policies? Well, no, I certainly hope so, but I think what Michael just said there was extremely optimistic about this being game-changing and people reversing all of these trends. Um, I'm not convinced. There has been a ginormous industry, both political and industrial, set up to deal with climate change mm. as, a, as a crisis um, through alternative means, which uh, um, decries nuclear energy um, at the highest level. We, even at um, COP26 in Glasgow last year, we saw that people from the, the nuclear industry weren't even you know, welcomed and, and, and warmed at the event, even though this is clearly, to anyone who takes the evidence firsthand, as the best opportunity for us to navigate both um, climate concerns and also our, our energy supply. Um, but, uh, I mean, Michael briefly touched on the fact that Britain was maybe pushing in this direction. But, I mean, there are more people in Britain who are, I think, uh, paying for climate anxiety therapy sessions than they are engaged in actually turning this problem around. There is a huge kind of blob of people who are obsessed with this problem, purely from a perspective of Armageddon and destruction and will not see um, the threat of Putin or Xi in, in, in China as a, as a reason to turn their backs on it. I mean, what do you think about Michael, what Michael said in terms of it's almost become a kind of religion, it's mm. almost an act of faith, this, um, you know, doomsday cult, mm. as you will. I mean, do you think that? Yeah, well, hence the, hence the language about Armageddon, right? These people believe in death and destruction as a, as a highly likely scenario in, the, in their lifetimes, right, which mm. is obviously wild. Um, and, you know, like small children being paraded through the streets of London crying about they've been told by their parents that unless politicians sign some small form, the world's going to end. What about fracking? I mean, do you think that we should embrace fracking? I, mean, I, I think I... we should do everything we can yeah. to reduce our reliance on the foreign import of on gas and oil. Britain is generally in a good place for this. But fracking absolutely should be considered, not just considered, it. we should run away with it. Uh, and, the, and the same is true for nuclear energy. Nuclear and fracking um, will make a ginormous difference in our reliance on, on foreign gas imports. I mean, is, is the nation state and sovereignty back? Because, I mean, we've just had for the last few years an attack on the idea of sovereignty mm -hmm. and borders and things like that. And now we are seeing political leaders reassert the importance of sovereignty, reassert the uh, importance of boundaries and borders and, and national self-determination. Mm -hmm. I mean, this does seem very different to what we were hearing over only a few months ago. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 the, and the word on everyone's lips right now is obviously security because it, this is an opportunity to defend your nation, defend your people, and this is achieved when you can be increasingly self-sufficient. Energy is a key way of doing that.